This night has got to top them all. Imagine the first Television Academy Hall of Fame. Frankie, this is it. This is it. This is it. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 14th Annual Television Academy Hall of Fame. Tonight, honoring Herbert Brodkin, Jim Lehrer, Robert McNeil, Lorne Michaels, Carl Reiner, Fred Rogers, Fred Silverman, and Ethel Winant. Please welcome the director of A Few Good Men and the American President, Rob Reiner. Good evening, welcome to the 14th Annual Television Academy Hall of Fame presentation. As you've seen there's been an impressive list of television pioneers in all phases of the media, in which we are, have been honored and uh, with induction into this august body tonight. We're going to add eight more bodies to that roster. And the body that I am uh, assigned to talk about uh, is a man that, uh, first of all, I want to say thank you, Dad, for uh, making love to Mom 52 years ago. <laughs> thank you very much for that. Um, and, and two other times that I know of that you did it. There's, there's my sister Annie and my brother Lucas. So we know three times for sure they did it. It's very difficult to grow up in, in Karl Reiner's shadow. His, his, his accomplishments are obvious and uh, they're huge and monumental. And the pressure of growing up under that shadow was difficult. And that, as a child of eight, I went to my father and I said, you know, Dad, I, I, I want to change my name. And he thought, oh, God, this poor kid, you know, he, he's, he's being so burdened by the, by the name. And he says, well, what do you want to change it to? I said, Carl. <laughs> and the reason I wanted to change it to Carl is because not only is he a brilliant comedian and creative person, but he is a terrific person. And he is loved by everyone. He, uh, people who meet him, are, right away, they light up, they feel good. He makes people feel good. Uh, and that's uh, the reason I wanted to be Carl Reiner, because he adds fun into everybody's life. And uh, you can imagine uh, the, the outpouring that, that, that has occurred. I mean, from all over the globe, uh, there have been uh, people sending messages and telegrams, and I've got a few of them here. Uh, now, but they are from, you know, different parts of the world, and uh, they're in different languages, so uh, rather than try to, you know, figure them out and guess their contents, I've called on the services of a brilliant linguist to translate the precise meaning of these messages. Please welcome Doctor of Romance and Languages, J. Sidney Caesar. Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, now, our first telegram here, it comes from uh, Berlin. Would you uh, care to I translate no, that is, for us? This is Francais. Francesca. This is Francais. Francais, oui. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Bonsoir, mesdames et messieurs, sur mon bâtiment centre, les 20 ans de la République de Français. Est-ce que vous en avez un petit peu à la présidente, Georges Chirac Nous le sommes prêts à pas mal tout de même. Nous sommes rébillés par tous les contrôleurs. Nous sommes les légendes de honneur que font le rapidaire Karl Reynier. L'histoire de son pays, la femme de Rodney Sandor, l'homme de Trump, a fait une mère, Jeanne d'Arc. Parce que Rosa, le trail de Jeanne d'Arc, son soubattoire, que Pira Karl Reynier, was the lawyer. Ce n'est pas le bâtiment aussi pas. 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 Victor Hugo s'en trouvait les pères de son enfer de l'île de Nadel, Les Misérables. Son enfant n'est qu'un peur de son enfer, il peut tourner et calme. Quand il y a un autre son enfer, il peut tourner et calme. 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 Emile Zoller, son frère Mille Sand André, il peut son pâle à un problème. Louis Pasteur, son trône et sa trône et femme. Rébis, 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 son son pour les femmes. Quand il y a un autre son enfer, il peut tourner et calme. Il peut tourner et calme. Il peut Sarah Bernhardt, de toile de son pompe de pomme, qui est dans son train de Maurice Chevalier, c'est le temps pour les pompes de pipi de pompe, 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 pompe,
Sì. Buonasera, signori e signorine. Ma cosa fa? Lo piaccio così che ho per mano chiusa una casa. Non tu so che ve la sono mai tardi, non sono un chilato. Leonardo di Vinci, che so per la fumola che fa la cicciata. Michelangelo, Matorino, Michelangelo Panorotti. Sono su libro con l'ombra virata, di Sino, di Dimmi, di Chappell. Sono su libro di Penti che lo fanno lo cinema che lo sono fuori e viso che importa. Di Pop che me la c'è da che è. Cazzo di vero, che cala lei, non vedi, non c'è da che è. Che Che mandavo io sono da Ma con la pioggia che scena che vanno nel Senegaro, con un matto, ma che lo suonare. We can a wallpaper, cosa non vi piace che sia. Many, many, many more time, you're going to say. The Television Academy's tribute to Carl Weiner will continue. If I am remembered for anything in this world, I think I will be remembered as the man who discovered and brought to you the 2,000-year-old man, Mr. Mel Brooks. I just want to say that I, you know, what a thrill it is to, to be here. I mean, it's, it's, it's overwhelming to be in your presence. Can you imagine how I feel? <laughs> I'm in my presence 24 hours a day. Yeah. Constantly overwhelmed. Yes, I can imagine. Now, you, sir, you li you've lived for 2,000 years. I can't believe I'm doing this. <laughs> I can't believe I'm doing this. This is just, we're in the, woo, surreal. Okay, you've lived for 2,000 years, yes, sir. Yes, certainly. Yes, and you've known, you've known so many people over the years, uh, and you've known uh, Carl Reiner, certainly. Oh, uh, can, you, can you give us any of the, the genesis, the, the lineage of, of Carl Reiner? Do, do, how far back do the Reiners go? I mean, mm, what was the Reiner, first Reiner, Reiner that you remember? Reiner, Reiner. Roman Empire. I can go that Really? Yeah, absolutely. The Reiners go back to the absolutely. Roman Empire. They go back to the Roman Empire. Maximus Reiner. <laughs> Maximus Reiner. Absolutely. Yes. Worked, he was an important figure yes. in the court. In the court? Of, of Julius Caesar. He was a he was an important figure in the court of Caesar. Caesar would never work without Reiner. Right. I can tell you that. Right. 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 Now, 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 the Reiners, you know, Carl Reiner, we know, is history and show business. What was, what, where, does the, where does the genesis of that? Are there any Reiners, in, in, you know, in, in his ancestry that... Uh, the Reiners started to curve into show business. Yes. Uh, in 1905. Really? Oh, absolutely. The turn of the century. P.T. Reiner. P.T. Reiner. Worked, yes. Had a, worked in a lion act in the circus. He was, absolutely. He was, he was a lion tamer. Just the opposite. No. The opposite. A lion annoyer. A lion annoyer. He annoyed because how does that work? when the tamer tamed the lions, yeah. there's no second show. Right. The, they're, the they're lions are tamed. They're quiet. Yeah, they, they're, they're not moving. So they need a lion. They got Reiner with a sharp stick, and he would annoy, go in the cage and annoy, annoy them. The lion. Very dangerous yeah. job. Yeah, so they're, now they're annoyed. Now the they're lion? annoyed, and then the tamer can go tame in and tame, tame him again. Tame him again. I see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I see. You want to be Mel Brooks for a second? Yeah. Okay, you want to take the hat off of that? All right. Now he's Mel Brooks. Now you can talk from the heart. I'm Mel Brooks. I'm Mel Brooks. I'm Mel Brooks. I'm Mel Brooks. I'm Hitler! Never <laughs> 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 oh, mind. <laughs> didn't expect that. Did no, you? I did. Carl has been a friend of mine for what, 40 years, whatever? We started back in the show of shows with Sid Caesar, who was sitting behind him. It was a wonderful experience. I love this guy. The only way. I could love this man more if I was bisexual. Yeah. And then I'd really love yes, him. Yes, yeah, twice as much. We'd have a good time. Thank right? you, Mel. Okay, God bless. Thank Wonderful you. working with you. Mel no Brooks. Mel no Brooks. doing comedy when I came out of the army.
Television was just starting. My first big television break was a thing called The Fashion Story on ABC. As the witch they were born. Professionally, I met uh, Carl on your show of shows, and he really saved my life and, and my career, I guess, in the beginning, because every one of the writers was so loud in that room, even Carl himself. When I had a line, I uh, have a soft voice, I guess, and no one heard it. So I used to sit next to Carl, and I would say it, and Carl would say, Neil's got it, Neil's got it. This is your Rogan reporter, Carl Reiner, here at LaGuardia Airport. Wait. The Professor was an old vaudeville piece uh, where one person interviews another. So it worked right that he was always stepping off the plane. I said, here he is, the, the world's foremost expert on... Space travel and jet propulsion. Here he is now, Professor Ludwig von Spacebrain. Uh, jet propulsion is somewhat like this. <laughs> <laughs> After my run on the show of shows, I did a uh, Caesar's Hour. Starring Sid Caesar. My favorite sketch was called Dash Prancer. He was a big Hollywood star, but he was also a homewrecker. Hey, you two. Stop that kissing over there. Nobody's kissing. Well, that's funny. In this mirror, it looks like you're kissing. Look in the mirror. Kissing. <laughs> it certainly does. Doesn't it? it certainly does. I've never written a, a television pilot, so I wrote one for myself called Head of the Family. The character I played was called Robert Petrie. Oh, honey, I get paid to write bad jokes. That's why the show smells. It was not a bad pilot. Not anywhere as good as it finally became with Dick Van Dyke. The Dick Van Dyke Show. Starring Dick Van Dyke. Carl just understood human nature and had a great wisdom about him, even in those days, because he wasn't even 40 yet. Alan Brady. <laughs> yeah, we've, we've established that. Well, Alan Brady was uh, a composite, I guess, of a lot of, of people. Alan Brady. Alan Brady. Alan Brady. Buddy Sherrill. <laughs> The Alan Brady character was m written to have the force that scares people, you know, the guy who can fire you. Oh, no, Shut up, Mel. Yes, sir. Can't you understand me? I said I wanted to see Rob. That is Rob. I am Alan. You are Mel. This is a door. Use it. He was meant to come on every once in a while, and if they saw it was me, they'd say, Carl Ryan, he's just a second banana. So I had him hidden behind a telephone or the disembodied voice. Hey, Rob. Have you seen the uh, magazine yet? Read the article? Yeah, I haven't read it yet. Here it is. Just great. Yes, it's just wonderful. <laughs> Uh, what are you going to do, light my pencil? <laughs> we had written a few shows for him that required the face of the guy to be seen. Fellas? <laughs> there she is. There's the little lady who puts you out of business. <laughs> the winner in Hollywood is the Dick Van Dyke Show. When I finished the Dick Van Dyke show, the original Dick Van Dyke show, I said, that's it for situation comedy for me. I'll never do better than that. The new Dick Van Dyke show was my idea, simply because somebody built a studio very near my ranch in Arizona. And so I went to Carl to kind of be the overseer. You ever been with a cavalry officer? <laughs> I don't think I've ever had the pleasure, sir. Well, you're in for a treat, man. <laughs> My secretary and her friend came up with this idea, and when they told it to me, I said, wow, what an idea. And it was a show about a child catching your parents, making love for a second, and how do you treat that? And the president of the network said, we're not going to air it. And we said, wait a minute, you know, this is a responsible show. It's not like uh, we made up this idea. This is life. Anything you want to ask me? Well, there is one thing. What is it, Vita? Are we having another baby? Huh? <laughs> no, darling, we're not. We're not? Then what was all that for? <laughs> they didn't put it on. It played in Canada, and Canada didn't secede from the hemisphere. Why am I unhappy? What do you mean, you're not happy? Sam, you work with me. How many years, Sid? Exactly. When I met Paul Reiser at a party, he said, hey, would you do a show for us? And I said what I said to most people. I said, no. And they said, no, we don't want you. We want Alan Brady. I watched your film again last night. I watched it with my wife and a watch. 
You know what I found out? I'll okay. tell you what I found out. I'm in this for six minutes. 360 lousy seconds in the whole history of television? Is that what you think I am? You talk now. Okay. If anybody belongs in the Academy Hall of Fame, it's Carl Reiner. His taste and the quality of his writing, everything he has contributed to the television industry, he, he deserves a special award in my opinion. Um, you know, everyone knows the, the, the wonderful career that my father's had, and up until uh, the last number of years, what obviously is more important to me is, is him as a father. And I can tell you that um, he's a wonderful father. He's a terrific person. Uh, I learned at his knee uh, not only about what I do in show business, but also about how to be a man and how also how to be a father. And I am so honored and thrilled and happy to uh, have you here tonight and honor you, Dad. Come on up. Carl Reiner. <laughs> The only thing I can think of to say is I'm so glad that I got this award now and not posthumously. <laughs> I would have missed all this wonderful stuff. You know, I'm most proud of the fact that my son came up and said those things about here, me and that my wife for 55 years, we had one, one marriage apiece, three children of the one marriage. They're all maybe the nicest human beings I know. The first time I was told about this thing being in M their thing Academy, it was 1950, and somebody called and said, you were nominated for a, an Emmy. And I said, what's an Emmy? Didn't know it. And in 1950, when it first started, I lost to Judy Splinters and Shirley Dinsdale. At, a ventriloquist and her dummy. <laughs> and I want to thank them for not competing this year, because they might have been standing here this year. <laughs> thank you. Gentlemen, the star of the series, smart guy, Taj Mori. Good evening. Recently, you might have noticed all the networks and television producers are attempting to raise the quality of their children's programming. They have come to realize what our next honoree has known for over four decades. Kids are people. Kids like to learn things. And kids appreciate when someone of greater height doesn't talk down to them. Ever since I was a small child, I was not only allowed, but encouraged to watch, watch Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood on television. I learned so many things that stood me in good stead in my later years. And I'm not ashamed to admit that even I, like many of you closet Mr. Roger fans, still visit the neighborhood whenever I can. changed a great deal since 1968 when Mr. Rogers first walked through the door, put on his cardigan sweater, changed his shoes, and talked to us as our neighbor. But the one thing that hasn't changed in all that time is the comforting voice and gentle smile of the man who assured us that it was okay to be exactly who we were and to feel the feelings we felt. Someday, oh someday, I'll know what to say Someday, oh someday I'll not have to say I'm not why, that interested why, why, in mass why, 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 communication. I'm much more interested in what happens between this person and the one person watching and the space between the television set and that person who's watching is very holy ground. 
I was in my parents' home, and I saw this fairly new thing called television. And I thought, this is going to be something that could revolutionize our country in a, in a wonderful way. And so after I graduated from college, I went to NBC in New York. I was assigned to such programs as the Gabby Hayes Show and the Kate Smith Hour. I found out that educational television was starting in Pittsburgh. So I was one of the first to start WQED. This is NET, the National Educational Television Network. Someone said, well, we'll need to have a children's program. And Josie Carey and I said, well, we'll make a children's program. And we called it the Children's Corner. Why I, no I, no you. We just developed things as they came to us. I had this bag of puppets at home, you know, and I would bring them in. Could we have a close-up of King Friday the 13th? Can't you hear him, Josie Bean? The Children's Corner was on the air eight years, and a friend of mine who was head of children's programming at CBC in Canada asked if I would do a program for him. Fred Rainsbury said, Fred, I've seen you talk with children. I'd like you to translate that to television. And I said, you mean in front of the camera? My name is Mr. Rogers. And we did that for a year. And Joanne and I decided that we would like to raise the boys in Pittsburgh. And so we came back from Canada and people asked if we would integrate some of the Canadian material into programming for Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. It's a beautiful day in this neighborhood, a beautiful day for a neighbor. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? But we feel on the neighborhood that whatever is mentionable is much more manageable. And so for children to be able to see us dealing with such things as the death of a pet, or the trauma of living through a divorce. Did you ever know any grown-ups who got married and then later they got a divorce? These are all things that are allowed to be talked about and allowed to be felt. I know a little girl and a little boy whose mother and father got a divorce, and those children cried and cried Jeff Erlinger and I met when he was a very little boy. I said, do you think that you would show your electric wheelchair to our television neighbors? He said, what are we going to do? And I said, you just be yourself. And then maybe we'll sing a song together. Okay, he said. And it was one of the most natural moments that one could ever hope for. It's you. I like it's not the things you wear it's not the way you do your hair but it's you I like the way you are right now the way down deep inside you not the things that hide you not your fancy chair <laughs> that's just beside you what some children can put up with, grow into, and then later flourish and help others with is a, a, a wonderful mystery. That it's you I like, it's you yourself, it's you, it's you I. And it is you I like, Jeff. Thanks. Please welcome Jeffrey Erlinger. It is quite hard. I'm so glad to see you. Oh, thank you for coming. My pleasure. Oh. It is what a surprise.
It's an honor to be here tonight, to be part of your proud moment, this proud moment. You know, when, when you tell people that it's you I, it's you I like, you, we know that you really mean it. And tonight, I want to let you know that on behalf of millions of children and grown-ups, it is you that I like. Absolutely. Okay. Well, yeah. to Jeff Erlinger and all of the uh, all of the wonderful neighbors who have grown up with our neighborhood. This this was, of course, completely unexpected and what a what a wonderful gift and I thank the Academy for allowing this to happen uh, Jeff and I haven't been together for a while we met when he was I think four years old five, five. such good neighbors well this is what I wanted to tell you before I knew that I'd have this great gift tonight fame is a four-letter word. And like tape, or zoom, or face, or pain, or life, or love, what ultimately matters is what we do with it. I feel that those of us in television are chosen to be servants. It doesn't matter what our particular job. We are chosen to help meet the deeper needs of those who watch and listen, day and night. The conductor of the orchestra at the Hollywood Bowl grew up in a family that had little interest in music, but he often tells people he found his early inspiration from the fine musicians on television. Last month, a 13-year-old boy abducted an eight-year-old girl. And when people ask him why, he said he learned about it on TV. Something different to try, he said. Life's cheap, what does it matter? Well, life isn't cheap. It's the greatest mystery of any millennium. And television needs to do all it can to broadcast that to show and tell what the good in life is all about. But how do we make goodness attractive? By doing whatever we can to bring courage to those whose lives move near our own. By treating our neighbor at least as well as we treat ourselves. And allowing that to inform everything that we produce. Who in your life has been such a servant to you? Who has helped you love the good that grows within you? Let's just take 10 seconds to think of some of those people who have loved us and wanted what was best for us in life. Those who have encouraged us to become who we are tonight. Just 10 seconds of silence. I'll watch the time. No matter where they are, either here or in heaven, Imagine how pleased those people must be to know that you thought of them right now. We all have only one life to live on earth, and through television, we have the choice of encouraging others to demean this life or to cherish it, 
in creative, imaginative ways. On behalf of all of us at Family Communications and the Public Broadcasting Service, I thank you for all the good that you do in this unique enterprise and for wanting our neighborhood to be a part of the celebration tonight. Thank you very much. Next, the Television Academy honors journalists Robert McNeil and Jim Lehrer. Jim Lehrer is off tonight. Judy Woodruff's in Washington. Judy? The American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees today predicted that employers all over will have to stop underpaying female-dominated jobs. Please welcome CNN anchor Judy Woodruff. Thank you. And before I read what I'm supposed to read, I want to tell you, as someone who uh, lives in Washington, D.C., that I came here tonight expecting to be impressed, uh, but I'm blown away. So I speak to you as someone who is not of this community, but who feels as if I've been brought into it. So I thank you for that. Before I say, <laughs> I am honored, I am delighted to be here to help honor the individuals who are associated with the most watched program on public television after the Teletubbies. <laughs> For a young woman working at uh, NBC News back in 1983, and you just saw it there, I was given a golden opportunity to work with two of the finest journalists this medium has ever produced. It was my odyssey with the urbane, wry, and sophisticated Canadian, and the down-home, Kansas-born ex-Marine from Texas. They are the best of friends. They are the brightest of journalists, both driven, and I mean driven to excellence, and the pursuit of truth. They set the highest of standards for television journalists and never, ever fall below that themselves. They are Robert McNeil and Jim Lehrer. There is no one definition of news, except that it's, uh, except from the word drop S, and you've got the definition, something new. We demonstrated um, that we could do it in a different and more comprehensive and analytical way. And suddenly the argument had been won over whether there was a role for public broadcasting in this area. My first journalism was with Reuters News Agency in London for five years. And I did a little broadcasting on the side, moonlighting for the CBC in Canada. And then I got hired um, by NBC. Robert McNeil, NBC News, Liverpool, England. I was a newspaper man in Dallas, Texas. The city editor of the afternoon newspaper and the local public television station asked me to come aboard as a consultant. I'm Jim Lair and this is Newsroom. It was reasonably successful and I came to Washington and started working for something called Impact and that's where I hooked up with uh, the former Robert McNeil. Within a few months, Jim and I found ourselves anchoring the Watergate Senate hearings together for 47 days and nights. And at 10.02 this morning, Senator Irvin gabbled open hearings that may well become just as historic. We are beginning these hearings today in an atmosphere of utmost gravity. And it made us a team. We also became good friends Absolutely. during that time. We'll be back tomorrow at the same time with the day's activity. Then WNET in New York asked him to start a nightly program. It had the worst title in the history of television. It was called The Robert McNeil Report. When we began, I was just the Washington correspondent, and then, then it became a... By sheer force of personality and, and journalistic skill. Mm -hmm. After about six months, the name was changed to The McNeil Air Report, and here we sit. Tonight, Jim Lehrer and I examine the many questions Israel's action leaves unanswered. The basic concept was a supplement to the nightly news program. So in other words, watch a nightly news program, then come to us for in-depth coverage of one story. 581 political dissidents have either died as a result of being tortured or been executed over the last four years in your country. Torture does not exist anymore in my country. 
if there was a big interview to do with a president or some big foreign figure, and there was no competition for the None big at get. None at all. Your system, it does presuppose that the leadership of the country, you, are, are always right. That you are infallible. Is that not so? No, it does not presuppose that. When we first uh, proposed the idea of expanding to an hour, it was not a universally applauded idea. Some people Within said, I think it, uh, I thought it already, already was. Already was, hour. right. <laughs> the mission of the news hour, as I see it, is this. Every evening, five nights a week, we will tell you, to the best of our professional judgment, what we think are the most important things that have happened since we talked to you last. East Germany's communist leaders in two stunning reversals gave in to the biggest demands of the growing democracy movement, free travel and free elections. If you've got a good news story and you're really looking to give people uh, either a lot of news or a real measure of depth about a given story, an hour is an awesome luxury. Would you like to be president of the Soviet Union someday? If I'm not too old, and I have strength. I think the political parties know they get in, Jim, an impeccably fair man who listens. I think that's one of Jim's great talents. He listens to what people say. Senator Dole, speaking of your tax plan, do you still think that's a good idea, the 15% across the board tax cut? Oh, yes, and you'll be eligible. And uh, so will the, Me too. So will the former president. Yes. I think the most important interview I did was the one I did with President Clinton. That was the day that the Winsky story broke. Shortly before uh, he came in the uh, Roosevelt room, I realized that, you know, I had to ask him about it. Would you acknowledge, though, Mr. President, this is very serious business, uh, this charge against you that's been made? And I will cooperate in the inquiry. I retired 20 years to the day from the day we began the show in 1975. That's right. And after our summary of the news this Friday, we say some goodbyes. My first reaction was, my, I just can't do this by myself because I never had. And it was his creation, not mine. Um, and it was his philosophy. And uh, I'm getting emotional. <laughs> you can get through this. <laughs> <laughs> These are men who were so wise, not just smart. They read, and they write, and they think. And they are probably as respected, if not more respected, than anyone in this industry, and they do it without being sensational and without worrying about whether they will ever be famous. And so they are. And without getting a big head. We'll see. You know, I've been with CNN for almost six years now, and I've loved the opportunities I've been given, and I'm proud of what we've done. And yet still, you know, every day I miss the news hour. Anyone who's ever spent time there must feel the same way. We are literally, and I mean this, a better country because of what they've done. And just as they were for the decade I was there, they remain my professional heroes. I am so proud to welcome Robin McNeil and Jim Lehrer to the Television Hall of Fame. We have said many times, it takes a lot of courage to be serious, but it takes even more courage to be boring on television. <laughs> and sometimes we are. But let me tell you just one quick thing. I am one of those few people that you will run across in journalism, print or electronic, who's really got it made. I have the opportunity, and I have had the opportunity for nearly 25 years to practice journalism the way I want to practice journalism. And that has been made possible by many, many, many people. And I am here tonight to say thank you to all of them, and in many ways, admitting Robin and me to the Hall of Fame, it says more about all of them, all of you, 
than it does us. Thank you very much. I second everything he says, as I always do. Um, I, uh, I knew I was going to be impressed to come here this evening, but to be on this stage with the talent that has been here this evening, both live and represented on the screens from the past, is overwhelming. And uh, I can't express how strongly I, uh, I feel gratitude for your recognition for first, for our efforts to bring a different dimension to what has become the dominant medium of journalism in our culture. Uh, I think the case for a non-commercial alternative in news is more obvious than it was in 1975 when we started. And with his great intelligence and his unwavering um, uh, instinct for straight and fair journalism. Jim Lehrer makes that case brilliantly five nights a week. Thank you. The cast of the Mary Tyler Moore Show reunites to honor top casting pro Ethel Winant. Have a little drink for me, please. I can't take a drink, baby. What do they do to you down that A place anyway? Aren't you a man anymore? Ladies and gentlemen, four-time Emmy Award-winning director John Frankenheimer. Days of Wine and Roses is one of the earlier projects I worked on with our next honoree, Ethel Wynant. I first met Ethel in California in 1956. It was a time of great experimentation, a time to test the new medium to see how far the boundaries could be stretched. It was a great time to be young and daring and creative and risk-taking. It was a great time to be Ethel Weiner. I was a young director at the time and was fortunate to be invited to Hollywood to direct some of those early TV dramas that had become a part of television history. This was the start of a personal and professional relationship with Ethel that has exceeded four decades and is still flourishing. Ethel's name is not as well known as some of her contemporaries, but her contribution to the careers of television luminaries such as Rod Serling, Fred Coe, David Susskind, and Herbert Bradkin, all Hall of Fame nominees or honorees, speaks volumes as to her expertise, her vision, and her courage. Tonight, Attention will be paid to this remarkable woman who's been the driving force behind some of television's proudest achievements. Well, I'm not a talent scout, so what I look for in an actor is his ability to act and bring life to a character. Ethel's career began in theater and on Broadway. Her introduction to television came with the chance to visit the set of Studio One. To the music! I've never felt that kind of energy. So the minute I walked into that room, I thought, this is heaven. I just love this. And so I just hung around. Ethel hung around Studio One so much, everyone thought she worked there, but she didn't. Her first real job in television began at David Susskind's Talent Associates. There, with her knowledge of theater, she established herself as one of the leading casting directors in the industry. It was my job to know actors around town and be able to make, you know, bring them in for shows. CBS recognized Ethel's talent, and in 1956, moved her to Hollywood. The, the directors wanted to bring me out to cast the show Playhouse 90. Starring Charles Lawton, Arthur Kennedy, and introducing Robert Redford. When Bob Redford was in his 20s and he walked into your office, if you didn't hire him, you were insane. There must be law and order. Oh, that I have no doubt. Law, law, my young friend. Well, this you, we could argue about. If it disturbed you, you should not have started the war. It was very difficult for a woman to succeed in this business in those early days, and she truly was a pioneer. Stand by. Those were the days of live television, and anything could happen. We did a show called Portrait of a Murderer, 
the end of the show comes, the kid dies in the gas chamber, then they do a commercial, and the last line of the commercial is, Today, more people than ever are cooking with gas. And so they were outraged, and they were very upset, the gas company. Ethel's credits expanded to include familiar ground and unexplored territory. It is an area which we call the Twilight Zone. Admiring her tenacity, CBS promoted Ethel to Associate Director of Development. Here, her shows helped define an era. Promoted again, this time to head of casting. Ethel brought America the stars they loved to watch. You know, it's the sort of funeral I would want. Oh, not me. I want to be cremated and have my ashes thrown on Robert Redford. <laughs> she knew which people to get to get the proper performance. Ethel proved to be invaluable. And in 1973, CBS made her the first woman ever elected vice president of a network. This was big news in those days. I've been the only woman for so long that I never thought about it. I mean, there were things that you had to do, like in the executive dining room, there was a bathroom which had no lock. And I figured out that if I took my shoes off and left my shoes outside the door, that these guys would know that I was in the bathroom. Ethel left CBS to take on new challenges, using her many talents to enrich children's programming on public television. Well, you see, Bert, what I'm doing is I'm working on a way to protect children against terrible diseases like polio, measles, diphtheria, German measles, whooping cough, mumps, and lockjaw. Next, Ethel joined NBC, and in 1979 became vice president of miniseries and special projects. There, she expanded the world of primetime television. Pilot Major John Blackthorne. May I present the Lady Toda Buntaro Mariko? Mariko Tomoshimas. I am honored, Lady. After her stint at NBC, Ethel became an independent producer. Never one to shy away from sensitive material, Ethel loved bringing history to life in epic proportions. And what do you call this little piece of heaven? This is Andersonville. I really love doing Andersonville. We cared so much about the show because we were put together in this stockade. Those of us who did the show were also in that prison. It was an impossible show to make, and we made it. Ethel continues to produce quality television defined by her keen eye for talent. And her actors often give us their most powerful performances. And I say segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. <laughs> They're the ones who make the show. I don't make the show. I put the things together, and they make the show. With all her success, there is one show that Ethel points to with utmost pride. I'm thrilled that many of the actors to whom I didn't give their first jobs, but whom I managed to pull out of anonymity, that I was able to give them the part that changed their life. That's what's wonderful. That's, that's why I love the Mary Tyler Moore show more than any show I ever cast. Treasure, you people. <laughs> I think we all need some Kleenex. There's some on Mary's desk. <laughs> I think we could all use a microphone. <laughs> There's one on Mary's podium. not for this very special lady, Ethel Winant, there never would have been a group hug, or even a group. <laughs> Ethel, with her remarkable eye for talent, not only rediscovered most of the cast members who were toiling at their profession in less visible arenas, she fought the network for them all and refused to accept a rejection on any of them. Ethel has had many firsts in her her life, and this is one that she can be especially proud of. 
because it's the first time her peers and her friends have had a chance to express their admiration to her for all of the years of love and dedication for a lifetime of commitment to excellence. Ed? Ethel, we're here because we all owe you for that lifetime commitment to excellence. For every role you've been asked to play, any time, any place. Georgia. For your pursuit and support of talent and your unwavering willingness to go to bat for us. <laughs> Val. For being a strong, consistent voice and a just, a, well, extraordinary, uh, shining example for women in our industry. Betty and the smile of reassurance that calmed and inspired countless actors and network executives. <laughs> Cloris? <laughs> and for your wisdom in recognizing that someone with five children at home, uh, 18 workmen, a divorce, that that person might need a little bit longer to get to work. <laughs> <laughs> You're cool, Ethel. <laughs> The Television Academy is pleased to honor its shining exemplar, Ethel Wynant. Thank you, John. Thank you for 40 years of friendship and, and work and love. And to you guys, you made me so happy for so many years. It's like a dream come true to have you all together on the stage and that you care. I, I, as one of the few women executives, I, I, the advice I always gave to young women who came into the nail course was, for God's sake, never let them see you cry. <laughs> well, I certainly blew that tonight. <laughs> in 1939, my mother took me to the World's Fair in New York, and we went to see the world of tomorrow. And as we entered the century of progress, we crossed a bridge, and as, you, and as you looked up, you saw yourself on television. That was the very first time I'd ever seen television. What I didn't know was that that bridge was a magic carpet that was going to take me through to the place where I was going to spend most of my adult life. It was going to give me an unbelievable experience. It was going to take Ethel Wald from Marysville, California to this podium tonight. It's like a dream. It is a dream. How could it happen? How could I be honored like this by the Academy? Well, I'll tell you something. It's the work. It's television. It's this wonderful medium. I've spent my life in the happiest of worlds, where I've always wanted to be, making these shows with these unbelievably wonderful, creative people, the people whose pictures you've seen tonight, the people who've talked to each other here. These people have been my friends. It, it, it couldn't happen. It didn't, I, it, it, it's just one of those miracles that could only happen in this wonderful business called television. In the last few months, I've had a terrible problem and I was very frightened and I, I didn't know what would become of me, but my friend, Frank Roder, mentioned it to a few of my professional friends and their support 
and their love and their generosity to me at this time has made me learn something, has taught me the greatest lesson of my life. There's another bridge in front of me that I have to cross. And I've always been a little afraid of it because I have no idea of what's on the other side. And that's frightened me. But now I know it doesn't matter. Because no matter what there is on the other side, it's all right. Because in my life in television, I've already experienced heaven. Thank you all so much. Dick Van Dyke and more from the Television Academy Hall of Fame when we return. Good evening. I'm one of the many people who've had the unenviable task of following Fred Silverman here at CBS. It was tough for anyone to fill his shoes, let alone fill his seat. That's because Fred made the tough decisions. Like should Mary Tyler Moore live in Minneapolis or St. Paul? Should John Boy say good night at the end of Walton's or just see you in the morning? And should MASH have periods after each letter or those funny looking asterisk things? It is for these reasons and a lot more that Fred has always been the apple of our eye. In 1963, at the ripe old age of 25, Fred Silverman became the director of daytime programming here at CBS and ushered in the age of Saturday morning cartoons with hits like Wacky Races, <laughs> Fat Albert and the Cosby Kids, and Scooby-Doo. In 1970, with ratings on the rise, CBS promoted young Fred to head of programs, where he immediately set about revamping the aging schedule. Green Acres is the place to be. He transformed the network's stable of rural primetime programs to a hip urban lineup with shows like All in the Family. It's very simple, Mrs. Bunker. I'm an agnostic. Oh. <laughs> Want a rabbi? His keen eye for likable characters made Fred the master of the spin-off. I wear the pants in this family. And when you zip them up, include your mouth. And the people he brought into our homes were like members of the family. I mean, I'm not sure. Maybe bosses you around, but he doesn't treat you like a child. He respects you as a mature adult. Then why won't he let me go to the circus? We cared about them in faraway places and laughed with them closer to home. JJ, why don't you paint things like trees, mountains, green meadows? Soon as we get some of them around here, I'll paint them. <laughs> Under Fred's watchful eye, CBS had a lineup that America simply loved. Good night, John Boy. Night, honey. Actually, all in the family and the Waltons are closer than you would think, because both shows really stress, you know, the sanctity of the family unit. Fred could always spot a hit. Charmed by a husband and wife singing duo on a talk show, he gave them their shot on a summer replacement and grabbed the ratings and stole our hearts. I got you, babe. I got you, babe. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. God bless you. When Fred left CBS, we were firmly in first place. Fred Silverman was at ABC from 1975 through 1978, a time referred to lovingly as the Silverman years, mostly by Fred. In those glory days, he would sit in this very office, the throne is long since gone, and discuss the basics of TV programming, that is, the ABCs of ABC. He never stopped working on ideas for new shows. It was in this very room that Fred sent out the word, if two is enough, then three's company. At the annual Affiliates Golf Tournament, after hitting his seventh shot into the water, Fred declared, eight is enough. Fred Silverman knew a good idea when he saw one, and our network knew a good idea man when we saw one. Fred became president of ABC Entertainment, and within a year and a half, he took us from worst to first. Once again, he did it with likable character-driven sitcoms that sometimes pushed the envelope. So. When you hear the news, I'd get on. I'm sorry, I didn't realize you had company. I... 
Fred also gave us a lineup of one-hour dramas that warmed the hearts of every American household. He believed in the power of love and imagination. This is Fantasy Island, and here anything is possible. Again, Fred knew a hit when he saw one. After catching a brother and sister team on the Mike Douglas show, he booked America's darlings, Donnie and Marie. Dubbed the man with the golden gut, if Fred had the feeling a show was going to be a hit, it was. The first thing you do is you look at the audience that you're trying to reach. It was a blue collar, 18 to 49 uh, audience. Possibly his greatest achievement here at ABC came in 1977 when Fred greenlighted the television event that transfixed the nation, Roots. I tell you, Fred, sometimes it seemed like being alone and being free, you're all the same for a slave. You don't be free. You be dead. Then I be free. By the time Fred left, we here at ABC were a solid number one. For those of us at NBC, it's our network. But it was once Fred's network, too. When he arrived, Fred Silverman became the only person in the history of television responsible for programming at all three networks. And he also had a paper wrap. So he was really busy. To say Fred changed the face of television would be an overstatement. But he did give it an eye job, a chin implant, and a dermabrasion. So that it looked a whole lot better when he left than when he came in. Anyway, Fred was proud as a peacock to be here, and we were happy as a clam to have him. In his three years as president and CEO, Fred launched NBC toward its dominance of the airwaves in the 80s and 90s, gripping true-to-life dramas, Let's be careful out here. compelling miniseries, and youthful sitcoms ensured that by the time Fred left NBC, we were well on our way to number one. And Fred didn't do too badly himself. As an independent producer, he created hundreds of hours of primetime television for all three networks. He made crime pay off with big ratings. Fred put Raymond Burr back on the case. He sent Andy Griffith into the courtroom. And while providing the shows America loved for over 36 years, Fred always had the right prescription. I think that Cloyd deliberately crashed that car into the pole and killed herself and Richard Locke. Murder, suicide committed by the jilted lover. I'm afraid it's gonna happen again. Ladies and gentlemen, TV Hall of Fame member Dick Van Dyke. This is a wonderful evening. I'm so happy I came. <laughs> Mr. Rogers, I hope a lot of people in high places listen to what you said. <laughs> you know, the word three-peat was not yet invented when Fred Silverman was setting records calling the shots on all three networks, but it's certainly an apt description of his success story. For his remarkable ability to assess what the public wanted to see, and to supply their demands in an ever-changing environment for trusting his own instincts, both as a network head and as an independent producer, for discovering and nurturing young executives to develop and expand their vision for this industry, and for being a child of television and applying that enthusiasm into growth for this medium. The Television Academy adds another title to his already impressive list of credits, that of inductee into the Hall of Fame, would you please welcome an extraordinary man and my boss, Fred Silverman. <laughs> I had some prepared remarks, but I may as well put them away because it's, you've just seen them all on the film there. Uh, <clears throat> I really would like to take this time to thank the Academy for this great honor. It's uh, actually 40 years, almost to the day, uh, that I started in the television business. That was uh, back in Chicago at WGN Television. I, I really was blessed to work with some of the best uh, creative people in the business. I mean, really giants. And uh, to this day, I'm beholden uh, to all of them. 
you know, I'm thankful for the 40 years. And most importantly, you know, I'm thankful to my wife, Kathy, you know, who's put up with my craziness. And uh, my, my children, Melissa and Bill, uh, you know, they really uh, have made it all worthwhile. And I thank you and the Academy, you know, for this really great honor. I'm most appreciative. Thank you. Gentlemen, the Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of the Television Academy of Arts and Sciences, Merle Marshall. Imagine sitting down with William Shakespeare to chat about what it felt like opening night of Hamlet. Picture a camera, lights, and videotape, and the opportunity to capture a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Beethoven, Goya, Emily Dickinson, or Scott Joplin. Music, theater, art, and literature would come alive as never before. You would have the story firsthand from the creators themselves. Today, we have the wonderful opportunity to document for all time the story of television from the hearts and minds of those who advance this powerful medium. The Academy of Television Arts and Sciences Foundation has established a living history, the archive of American television, to ensure that the struggles, stories, and insights of these visionaries are recorded and made available to inform and inspire generations to come. On behalf of tonight's honorees and all of the artists and craftspeople who dedicate their careers to television, we thank you for welcoming us into your homes. We commit ourselves to preserving our shared history, to educating future artists and storytellers, and reflecting your diversity and desire for excellence. Thank you. Or whether you believe it or not, I'm as interested in protecting the innocent as you are. That's part of my job. But once I'm convinced the people have to prosecute, I put on my armor, I sharpen my sword, I get out here in court, and I flail around with every drop of strength that's in me. Please welcome Emmy Award winning actor Jack Klugman. Thank you. Thank you. What a joyous night. I laughed until I cried, and I cried until I laughed. Thank you. I'm happy to be here to speak on behalf of a man who produced some of the finest dramatic series and specials ever, my friend Herbert Brodkin. You know, when Herb passed away, the industry lost an irreplaceable treasure. If, as it is said, the squeaky wheel gets the grease, Herb was just about it greaseless, because he worked quietly and efficiently. Yet in the final analysis, the products he turned out spoke volumes as to his taste and abilities. Every show that bore his name also bore the mark of the man whose integrity we honor tonight, my friend, Herbert Brodkin. I can't think of any producer whose body of work was as consistently excellent and entertaining and thought-provoking as the Herb Brodkin body of shows. I joined Herb Brodkin in 1962, and Herb and I worked together uh, from that point in, until he died in 1990. Herb started in television as a production designer on a show called Charlie Wilde, Private Detective. Yes, I have a dinner engagement, and I don't want to be late. Let's go! Hey, lady! I'm no lady. At some point during the course of that production, Herb took over as the producer of the show. And from that, he produced some of the most notable shows in the history of live anthology drama. I'm your mother. You've got to listen to me. You've got to listen to Shut me. Shut up! You've got to listen to me! Well, you never believed that Herb Brodkin was a producer because he was so nice. I think Brodkin was attracted by stories with social content and uh, tending to deal with urban problems primarily. The Alcoa Hour, brought to you live from New York. Tragedy in a temporary town was about the sort of pain and the aimlessness of living in a trailer camp and the kind of tensions that culminated in a racial explosion. Well, let me tell you something. 
Every time the pigs like you mob together to become your own law, you crawl one step closer to the cliff. While you were doing a Class A show like Studio One, we had to work quickly, but it was uh, always, always with great thoroughness. The, uh, the, the, the rapidity with which we worked was never an excuse for sloppiness. Westinghouse Studio One. Herb understood the separate functions of actors, directors, writers, and did not intrude. In my experience as a writer with Herb as a producer, it was a very constructive kind of relationship. When you worked with Herb, you decided what the show was about. What were the issues? What was it really going to say? Boy, if you feel like you want to go on down there and you don't even have to go, Boy, I think that's going to tell everybody what kind of guys you are. In early television, the final broadcast was so close to where you began that nobody had too much time to do masterminding. Live from Television City in Hollywood. Herb just felt that you should be able to do whatever script you wanted to do. The tribunal finds you guilty. You are sentenced to life imprisonment. When he finished doing Playhouse 90, Herb got into doing film television. I'm managing quite well, Mr. Fox, thank you. Well, I would be if I could get you to shut your mouth for two minutes. You're managing too well. And that kind of upsets me, you know what I mean? To look at what ought to be a black man standing up straight and proud instead of looking like a second-rate Ivy Leaguer with shoe black all over his face trying to pretend it's not there. Herb had a great many shows that had a life beyond uh, their original start. Several went on to become series television. You're hanging that boy. That's not so. He's hanged himself. You're his lawyer. You're supposed to do everything Don't you, you can. Don't tell me what I'm supposed to do. The Defender that was done for Studio One, most notably, became The Defenders. How are you going to defend him? That's something I haven't had time to think about yet. Herb went through a... Uh, uh, a new period in his life, and that's the place where, where I joined him. I oversaw the production of Shane and all the other series along with Herb as his assistant. What am I again? A, a class double-A grind? In translation, he's hooked on books and has a very heavy schedule. Yeah, much too heavy to waste time listening to the voice of rebellion. You are really pathetic. You know that everything I say is absolutely right. Herb felt that everything stemmed from the material. If you have a wonderful script, you have no problem getting all the good actors. I have cherished the ideal of a democratic and free society. It is an ideal for which I am prepared to die. In Skokie, you had the phenomenon of the ACLU defending an American Nazi against the Jewish survivors who lived in Skokie, and CBS was very, very nervous about it. If the Nazi marches here in Skokie, I will be there with baseball bats, with a gun, with anything. I will be yeah. there in Skokie if the Nazis are We decided to do a major show about the Holocaust, and this was really Herb's idea. No, you won't go. And if you go, I'll go with you. But you can't, Inga. You must tell Carl. Oh, your child is in me. My child. The winner is Holocaust, Herbert Grodkin and Robert Berger. What Herb brought to the table as a producer was an absolute brutal quality of honesty. I like to think that these awards honor the real Holocaust. Thank you. Defining a Herb Brodkin production is not easy. It was the simplicity of excellence. That's what Herb stood for, and uh, that's what we should appreciate him for. What an incredible amount of talent. And for bringing the industry and nurturing some of its most respected and creative writers and directors of drama for consistently delivering the kinds of shows that enable defenders of the medium to point with pride and say, 
This is what television can be. The Television Academy points with pride to his accomplishments, and tonight, longtime friend and partner Robert Buzzberger proudly welcomes into the Hall of Fame Herbert Brotkin. Herb Brodkin was a complicated man, and yet in some ways he was amazingly simple. He adored his wife Patty and his daughters Bridget and Cindy. He loved fishing and he loved his work. Herb's work, although sometimes in the theater and occasionally in the cinema, was mostly in television. He was turned on by the immediacy of television, and he always contended that movies were for children and that television could deal with adult themes. Ed Murrow spoke about television as an instrument that can teach, can illuminate, and inspire, but only to the extent that it is used to those ends. Herb shows taught, they illuminated. Herb Brodkin was a man ahead of his time. He was my mentor, he was my partner, and he was my dear friend, and I miss him. It's with pride that I accept this honor on behalf of Herb's daughters, and I thank the Academy for bestowing it. Thank you very much. One wild and crazy guy is coming up to honor the genius behind Saturday Night Live. Stay tuned for Steve Martin. Thank you very much. Okay, we're having some fun now, eh, folks? Okay, it's uh, great to be here in New York. Um, I know that sounds phony, because every entertainer in the world comes out no matter where they are, and they always go, Hey, it's really great to be here. <laughs> That really sounds fake, but believe me, I am sincere when I say, hey, it's really great. Ladies and gentlemen, Steve Martin. Thank you. They had to humiliate me. You know, it would be easy for me to stand up here for the next few minutes and honor Lorne Michaels, but somehow, this seems to be neither the time nor place. <laughs> I, I know Lorne very well. I know that the last thing he wants is an award, believe me. He <laughs> suffers to think that he might be getting an award. He's embarrassed. He doesn't want to get dressed up. He doesn't want his friends to be bothered. And then every year when they announce the awards, he says, I can't believe I didn't get an award. <laughs> And now he is about to enter the Hall of Fame. How do you think this makes me feel? <laughs> Hurt and vulnerable. Lauren befriended me in 1975 when no one gave a damn about me except every person in America. <laughs> I loved his folksy ways how he loved to just sit around and have coffee with his old friends that other successful people might have long ago left behind. Mick Jagger, Paul Simon, and Mike Nichols. <laughs> Lauren's life changed eight years ago when he met his wife Alice, who not only gave him a solid home life, but also three beautiful children, and in return, he gave her a beautifully bound set of the Saturday Night Live videos. <laughs> but there's also a private side to Lorne Michaels. This is the shy, charitable benefactor, the person who gives of his time and his money without ever asking once for public acknowledgement. In fact, he is so secret about his private giving, it is actually quite difficult to trace. <laughs> Scores of detectives working around the clock <laughs> failed to uncover the charitable tracks of this humble and very private donor. It is my pleasure to be able to award, uh, give this award to Lauren tonight. When we met 25 years ago, I was just a fresh-faced lad, and Lauren looked the same as he does now. <laughs> but let's look at some of the highlights of his career. 
I remember early television vividly because it was something the whole family would watch, and so I pretty much watched everything I was allowed to watch. Rowan and Martin's Laugh-In. When I started writing, I worked in Los Angeles on Laugh-In, but before that on the beautiful Phyllis Diller show in 1968. After Greg Garrison hired us to do the Gold Digger show, the man who was then head of Canadian Broadcasting offered you know, a show that I did with my partner, Hart Pomerantz. And we did three years of a series up there that we called the Hart and Lauren Terrific Hour. After three years, I realized that I liked writing and producing better. I went back to California to write the Burns and Shriver Comedy Hour. I got a gift for Gab, you know what I mean? Yeah, eh? yeah, eh? yeah, eh? Gab, yeah. And I met Lily Tomlin, who was looking for writers for her television show. And that's the truth. Around that time, Dick Ebersol had just been made head of Late Night at NBC, and I went to meet with him about doing the kind of show that I'd proposed a couple of times. Live from New York, it's Saturday night! He's a writer, so he's a creative person, but he also had to deal with network people. He had to trust his artistic values, his sense of humor. Lorna went in there to parody television and use that as a vehicle for satire. New shimmers of floor wax and a dessert topping. <laughs> That's why I did the news stuff. Good evening, I'm Chevy Chase, and you're not. It was people who had grown up watching television, and that was the first time that, that we had been allowed to make television. Mr. Fader, you sound like a real attractive guy. <laughs> you belong in New Jersey. The community was small enough that you sort of knew who was funny and, and who was uh, promising. Got what I got. The hard way. How make better each and every day. Saturday Night Live from 1975 looks a thousand light years uh, ahead of Sonny and Cher and Flip Wilson in these shows where people come out at the top and they sing a little song about what we're going to do tonight. Welcome to the show, bump. And then you look at Saturday Night Live, and suddenly someone's talking the way you've heard people talk. What is that bewitching scent you're wearing? Vicks VapoRub! It must have looked insane to people when they first turned it on. They're gonna find out about you someday, though. Oh, yes. Yes, having sex with women, the president, within these very walls. That never happened when Dick Nixon was in the White House. One of the, the things that pleased me so much about it being live was that no one would see it until um, the audience saw it. Candy Graham. <laughs> the network had the good sense to le just let us be. And I, I think that was really directly their faith in Lorne. We are two wild and crazy guys. When I left in 1980, I would have been very happy if they'd canceled the show because <laughs> I was sort of shocked that they could do it without me. And so people are saying, well, what's next? We like to know a little bit about you for our fire. He loves music, and he knows who to put on the air. Always love you, Marie. Night Music was sort of a more sophisticated show in which they just had really, really good music. Please unchain my heart. Unchain my heart. Let them to be. I had worked on the new show with Lauren. He was trying not to be Saturday Night Live, but also was like Saturday Night Live. She told me her name was Billie Jean, and she caused a scene. Then her head turned with the ice cream. In 1985, when Brandon Tartikoff called me and said, Dick is leaving Saturday Night Live, I'm not sure we're going to keep it on, I came back. Brilliant! Thank you! Thank you! Thank you! The group that had done the show in the first five years had all left. And so I decided to go very young with the cast. The NBC Today Show and Olympic host Brian Gumbel's ego applied for statehood today. <laughs> we tend to give people enough room so that they can develop without that much pressure. Well, isn't that special? Lauren thinks a lot of writers. He holds writers, I think, in high regard. And as a result, he gives them a lot of responsibility. <laughs> yeah, that's a ticket. It was 1993. Lauren decided that uh, I should audition for the late night job and that I might be able to replace Letterman. And I still think it was a drunken wager. How I mean, did you get this job, by the way? 
for the, was it a theme writing contest? Yes. What? Yes. Yeah. It was a what would I do with a talk show, and I was fourth. Uh. The great thing about Saturday Night Live was that it, was, it really was show business. Because I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and doggone it, people like me. If we'd stayed at a 70s show, uh, we would have become a parody of ourselves. No way. Way. No way. Way. Excellent. There's never been an example where we read uh, something and, and it, we all thought it was funny and then everybody went, no, we shouldn't do that. You know what I hate? <laughs> Underpants. I'm just interested in putting the best 90 minutes on that I can. When Fred Rogers said tonight to think of people that have profoundly affected your life, I felt like I was the luckiest man in this room because two of them are in the room tonight, Carl Reiner and my good friend, Lorne Michaels. Thank you, Steve. <clears throat> Steve and I met uh, in 1975, and we grew old and gray together by 1977. <laughs> I'm just overwhelmed to be standing here alone tonight. No one knows more than a producer who does what and how many people you need to make a television show sparkle. And you need a network. And I've had NBC behind me from the very beginning. And what is still the best job in New York City. I want to take a moment to talk about Saturday Night Live, a show I've been watching for 25 years. And I've got to tell you, it's very uneven. <laughs> Everything good in my life has come from Saturday Night Live. Friends, colleagues, family. To have met and worked with so many extraordinary people over so many seasons is an honor. There's the exhilaration I feel when the show begins at 11.30, and there's that first laugh sometimes at a quarter to one. <laughs> There's the dedication of the people who do the show week after week and who continually put themselves on the line to make it come alive. Over the years, people I've worked with so closely and loved uh, have died. Uh, John Belushi, Gilda Radner, Michael O'Donoghue, Chris Farley, Phil Hartman. And I feel that at their loss and what I feel at their losses is, is inexpressible. But the show goes on, and the studio is so filled with them, and their presence there is so deep, that I still expect to run into them in the makeup room before air. Last, I want to talk about um, the best thing that ever happened to me in Studio 8H. About 10 years ago, uh, I was watching the show at dress rehearsal. I saw this incredibly pretty girl a red sweater standing under the bleachers. And I said to someone, who's that? And they said, that's Alice Berry. She's going to be working here. And I thought, OK. <laughs> and tonight, I, I see her there with the oldest of our three children, my son Henry. And I think, how lucky am I? I want to thank her for letting me stay so late at the office and for what my mother calls uh, my three greatest productions. And most importantly, for making it appear completely normal that daddy's still asleep at noon. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for joining us on this 14th Annual Television Academy Hall of Fame presentation. We invite you back next year to honor another group of television legends. This is Randy Thomas speaking, wishing you all a good evening.